Hello friends and welcome to another edition of Transformational Astrology. We're going to talk about the full moon coming up uh, just in a few days here. Um, and then uh, that'll, that'll be on Thursday the 11th. And then uh, we want to talk about what's going on with some of these outer planet configurations that are very prominent now. And I think they do reflect on both the zeitgeist that we're living through and also our individual transformational journeys. Uh, similarly, you know, you can think of an entity as the entity of uh, the United States as a, as a culture, as a country, though you can think of the global culture, the Western culture perhaps is differentiated from other parts of the world. You can think of it also, obviously, as, as an individual. And really, these outer planet configurations apply to both situations. We can look at it in terms of mundane astrology, so-called, which is about what's happening in the world, <clears throat> how that reflects what's going on in the sky, and vice versa. <laughs> and then uh, you can talk about the individual arc of development of each one of us. And amazingly, that all contributes, doesn't it? Uh, it's like a hologram. Each one of us is a little emblem of the entire society. And <clears throat> really, the influence we have, as I've said before, and it's really worth repeating, the influence we have is really more massive than we take credit for because everything we do ripples out from us in terms of vibrations, in terms of communication, in terms of awareness, in terms of consciousness. And um, we are part of the zeitgeist that we are, that we are part of the culture, that is to say, that is represented in the current zeitgeist. So there's a real close correspondence really between individual and collective. And, and we need to keep that always in mind because I will be talking about the mundane or the collective um, situation in looking at this full moon because it's really relevant. It's very exciting actually. So let's take a look at the chart. And uh, yep, here we see the full moon uh, represented um, by the moon still in, I mean the sun still in Leo. And uh, you know, we're looking at the natural chart. We're not looking at the actual rising. This is the Aries chart, or the natural chart, Aries whole sign on the ascendant, then Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, all the way around. Um, we do notice that the uh, ascendant on the west coast happens to be 22 Capricorn, close to Pluto. So we have Pluto rising at the time of the full moon coming up, which is actually um, 6 p.m. On, on the Thursday as far as the west coast time is concerned. But what I want to direct your attention to is a couple of really powerful T-squares not just one, but two that are in this full moon. And the first one is with the sun and moon. So the sun is 19 degrees, 21 minutes, opposite the moon in Aquarius at 1921 minutes, also 22. And we have uh, Uranus at 1851. So half a degree, if we add 30 uh, minutes of a degree or half a degree to 51, we get 21. <laughs> so it's like where we get you know, 81, which is 21, 1921. So half a degree off, we have this very close T-square to Uranus. And this is really significant. Um, brings up Uranus in a big way, uh, as it has already been, because this was also part of the new moon as well. Uh, there were planets, uh, I think it was Mercury was an exact square with Uranus in the new moon. And, you know, we had that famous August 1st chart, which I want to show you. So here we have August 1st. Uh, we have it for the West Coast, but it would be for 9 a.m., so it would be 6 a.m. on the East Coast. And what do we have? Uh, this is the very famous, everybody talked about it, how unusual it was and how significant it may be. Mars, North Node, North, North Node of the Moon, and Uranus all together at 18 degrees and a half, pretty much. And of course, it gets even closer, and this was also part of the new moon in a wider orb, about three degrees. So what do we have with this uh, Mars, Uranus, North Node triple conjunction on August 1st, but we have the biggest week for progressives <laughs> uh, in, in, in a long time. <laughs> so those of us who are rooting for the progressive cause, which I count myself as one, although I try to stay away from politics in this discussion, um, everybody agrees that it was a, it was a good year. It was a good week for the Democrats uh, because, you know, there's foreign policy um, victories of sorts because uh, one of the planners of 9-11 was, was actually executed uh, extrajudiciously with a drone strike. 
which looks good in a certain way for uh, this administration because of the Republicans accusing the administration of laxity and not being on top of things and not being able to handle things in Afghanistan and so on. And they're showing that they still have, uh, you know, significant um, military power in the world. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's a questionable. I mean, people might question that value. Uh, fine. But politically, it makes a difference because um, there's an election coming up and it's important that everybody get on the, the bandwagon. Well, it's important for the Democrats, I should say, for everybody to get on the bandwagon and, and vote Democratic. And the Republican agenda includes, uh, unfortunately, um, trying to have a federal ban on abortions, which I don't support myself. I think that it's a religious question and it doesn't belong in the uh, legal situation in the United States. So. I think a woman's right to choose is important. I stand on that. Uh, anyway, uh, there was also a big victory in terms of abortion rights this same week. It happened the very next day after August 1st on Tuesday, August 2nd, when there was a vote in Kansas to whether to allow the state legislature to pass abortion restrictions because they had planned to do that. Another of these uh, fairly, uh, you know, fairly strict, um, you could say radical, um, right-wing uh, laws coming up about abortion, uh, ruling it out, you know, even in the case of rape and incest, which is a kind of odd thing, but, you know, there's a religious principle involved in some cases, although it's a minority religious principle. If you look at the actual polling in the United States, it, the, the vast majority of people in the country, I wouldn't say it's a huge majority, but a definite, definite majority of people in the country are in favor of uh, abortion rights, you know, the woman's right to choose. And that was ratified in Kansas by an immense coalition of, of course, Democrats, but also Republicans uh, in large number, and also independents voting to uh, not allow Kansas to uh, ditch part of their state constitution that prevented uh, the legislature from coming up with, with anti-abortion legislation. So it was a victory for uh, the abortion, you know, the rights to abortion rights. And that was a huge victory, and that was maybe even a bellwether for future political situations. So the Democrats were doing well in a couple of senses uh, already. And then what happened um, later in the week was that uh, climate change finally got passed. That used to be called, uh, of course, the most uh, progressive version of that was the, the Green New Deal, which never quite um, got enough support from all sides. And then they had the Build Back Better, which unfortunately uh, did fail. I mean, I, I think it's unfortunate. I think climate change is very important. I think we should be working toward it. Uh, that had various sort of as aspects of it that didn't quite mesh with everybody. But they came up with a compromise, um, and it is called uh, inflation reduction. But it has within it uh, a lot of this climate change stuff that they've been trying to get past. That, that is to say the Democrats and Biden had been trying to get past, so it was a very, very good week for Democrats. And I'm just trying to point that out, that these things do have an impact in terms of, when I say these things, uh, Uranus represents progressive notions. It represents swinging for the fences. It represents in your own life, taking a chance, taking a risk, going for innovation. Innovation has risks associated with it, and it's an open question in each individual case, whether you want to go with the risk or go with the safety of, uh, you know, the existing status quo situation is sometimes uh, less risky. And that is usually represented by Saturn, which represents limitations. And we do see a broad square between Saturn and Uranus in these times. Uh, it's about, about three degrees off here. But on the other hand, oh, no, I'm sorry, four. Four degrees off here. But in, on the other hand, when we look at this full moon, so that was the background that I wanted to show you. And looking at the chart of the full moon itself, we do see that it brings up because it's also the moon is also conjunct within a few degrees. That's three degrees. Um, Saturn. So it does bring up this whole conflict of right versus left. And what do we have heading into this full moon? But this very new uh, information that the FBI has raided Donald Trump's um, palace in uh, Mar-a-Lago in uh, Florida. And that can be seen in two different ways. Of course, uh, the, the right-wingers are saying it's a, a violation. He, they shouldn't be investigating a former president. That's unprecedented. That's never happened before. 
Uh, and on the other hand, the FBI had a warrant to search because it's related to an investigation. There's a lot of investigations going on now, especially regarding um, Trump's responsibility for what happened on January 6th when a violent mob broke into the Capitol and ransacked the Capitol and tried to prevent the uh, peaceful transfer of power, the certification of the count in the Electoral College for Joe Biden. So. You know that some Republicans are still claiming Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. They're claiming there was some kind of fraud in the election. There's no evidence for that. I myself believe that's a political lie that's been told by Trump to try to promote his own cause and to try to get his own political chances, which is his best chance to stay out of jail after all. So anyway, um, that's the situation between right and left in this country right now. And it's just something we have to acknowledge. Um, we maybe don't want to make too much out of it. Certainly everybody has their own freedom of choice to believe the way they believe and to vote the way they vote. I'm not saying anything about that. But I am saying stand up for your own uh, ideas, whatever it might be, and vote the way your heart tells you. And it's a very important election coming up. And when is the election coming up? But on November 8th, it happens to be an eclipse. So looking at the November 8th chart, which I definitely want to mention in this context, we have to be aware, this is 6 a.m. Washington, D.C., uh, which is 3 a.m. Um, on Pacific time. I think that's right. Yes, it'll already be 6 a.m. in Washington. So... Um, this is uh, very interesting because it's not only an eclipse, you have sun and moon opposite each other at 16 degrees, and it is an eclipse, they're close enough to the nodal axis, so it is an eclipse, a total eclipse, a lunar eclipse. But look, the, the moon is actually conjunct, absolutely conjunct Uranus. And then uh, it's a pretty close square, being uh, 16 degrees, two and a half, well, it's almost three degrees different. So, it's not you know, as close as one or two, but it is a pretty close square between the position, and this is almost 17, so it is only about less than two degrees, actually. So we have uh, Uranus at 16, almost 17 degrees of Taurus, so very closely conjunct, partile conjunction to the eclipse moon, which, by the way, the eclipse sun is conjunct Mercury, which is awareness, right? So this is a huge, and that's media, you know, as far as the, the USA chart would be. We should look at how this hits the USA chart, by the way, too. But just looking at the raw data of this eclipse, just this eclipse chart itself, it is a really close T-square between Uranus and Saturn, which does bring out the whole conflict between right and left, the great chasm that we have in this country right now between directions that we want the country to go in. And that means that this is going to be very much part of that scene. When we have the election, who knows how it's going to come out, but we have a very strong... Um, battle, you could say, between um, conservative notions of, hey, let's go back to the past. Let's not try anything too, too wild and radical. Let's not have too much diversity in the country. And then you have the progressive idea that diversity is a great thing. It doesn't matter if people are from other parts of the world, if they have a different color skin. Uh, everybody has a right to be heard. Everybody that's a citizen has a right, certainly, to be uh, heard in their vote and has a right to express their opinion um, as we do in this country as democracy dictates. So that is <laughs> the situation and I think it's pretty wild. And uh, going back to this full moon itself, we do want to make note also, because besides the T-square that I mentioned already, which is Sun and Moon, Saturn, and a T-square to Uranus here at 18 degrees 51 minutes of Taurus, we have another T-square that's pretty uh, close, which I've been talking about, which is Eris, New planet, feminine warrior energy for soul intention means really standing up for your own deep values. It means finding out what you stand for, what you cannot not do, what you must do, and doing it and making sure that you're acting in support of, of where you are at the deep level, which means authentic, uh, you know, trying to be the most authentic version of yourself, trying to uh, aid yourself in the evolution that you must make during your lifetime to be a more authentic version of yourself. So it's very important uh, archetype in the current situation, um, 21st century archetype. Now, a couple of others have come along, as you know, if you've been hearing me talk about them, they are Maki Maki, this symbol I use, and Haumea, which is, these are both variations on the Pluto glyph without the cross below. 
And they do represent a um, deep uh, part of ourselves. And it, in this case, both represent a deep connection to nature. And I've been able to demonstrate that with a lot of research. Uh, so deep connection to nature, um, how may I more in a philosophical sense, um, just uh, loving nature in her ways, loving the connection philosophically that we all must recognize that we have to the earth, to the earth's creatures, to each one of our fellow humans. You know, it's, it's a concept that really has been around for a long time, that this is all kind of a mirage of difference, but we're all in one sense, in a sense, we're all one. So that's an important way to look at things. And I think it's one factor that's emerging in this 21st century um, evolution of values, evolution of society. Meanwhile, Haumea is very much the same idea of profound, profound connection to nature and also environmental concerns for nature right now because of the earth, because of the environmental catastrophe that we're in the midst of, that we have to do something about. We have to do something about climate change. And it's more of an activist. So represented um, most clearly by Greta Thunberg, who has it in a great, in a uh, Yad configuration to Eris in her chart between Mars and um, how uh, Maki Maki, uh, with a partile in conjunct between Maki Maki and, and uh, Eris. So it's, it's very clear in her chart as an activist, and she, of course, is a quintessential activist and woman warrior also, speaking truth to power and trying to, you know, get, get things straight, turned around for her generation and her children's <laughs> perspective, children's generation, you know, as, as the Iroquois used to say, seven generations you have to consider. And <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the short end of that <laughs> right now. So um, just to look at the connections, uh, besides the fact that Pluto is very closely squared within about a degree and a half, to Haumea, uh, also uh, recently stationed Jupiter is opposite to Maki Maki. So these are both in the configuration as well, in the configuration of the T-square to Pluto uh, from Eris and Haumea does represent, you know, this transformation that's happening in the culture, recognizing that we have to do something about climate change, that we have to kind of rein in some of the corporate excesses, uh, income inequality is an issue, um, Fossil fuel companies are an issue because they were dragging their feet on trying to uh, keep the oil in the ground, which, you know, burning of fossil fuels is one of the greatest uh, producers of the greenhouse gases that are causing the problem. And we're seeing the problem all over the world. We're seeing high temperatures all over the world, as everybody knows. So it is something we have to do something about and, and not just pretend it's not going on. And that is a, <laughs> a complete summary, I think of what I wanted to convey about, you know, just how powerful these times are that we're living in. Um, I don't think there's much more to say about this configuration of the full moon itself, just to recognize that this is a time when the, that right-left um, conflict or discrepancy in viewpoint, um, different ideas about how to proceed, how to go forward, um, are, are definitely in, um, in the news, in the, in the hearts and minds of the people everybody's really being um, triggered by this, you know, in, in many different ways. And of course, it's important that everybody, if they want to see their side, take the advantage and uh, hold the Congress and hold the Senate or uh, change the Congress and change the Senate and have Republicans in, we really have to all step up to the plate. And that's the message of Eris. That's what Eris is telling us. It's time to step up to the plate be who you are, do what it is that you must do to feel good about yourself going forward into the future as you proceed to evaluate and grow through the rest of your life. So with that, I'm going to transition back to the other viewpoint and just say, friends, that um, you know we can take heart because uh, the stars are there to tell us something. Uh, you know, the, the reflection of the planetary um, emblems that we can see in action on Earth and the things that are happening right here on Earth is profound and it's real. <laughs> and it's something magnificent to contemplate that we are part of a, of a larger picture of uh, evolving energies. Um, the universe has our back. The universe is communicating to us, as Rick Tarnas says, through the media of the planetary alignments and we don't have to think of ourselves 
as the only and sole beings in an otherwise mechanistic world that doesn't have a soul, we can instead go with the idea that everything has a soul. Uh, even the rocks and the trees have some kind of a soul consciousness, and certainly all humans do, and certainly recognize that all humans are part of our own being. There's a very profound recognition that we can come to uh, if we try. You know, if we, if we go with the John Lennon imagine, and we imagine that we are all one global society trying to help each other. And including the creatures, and including the planetary situation, including our environment, including not having millions of uh, environmental refugees, which is where we're headed. So that's thought, food for thought, I hope. Um, does affect each individual decision you make in your own life because you can go one way or the other. You know, I, I started to say about how Maya Makimaki also being just a sense of right and wrong, a sense of perennial wisdom, um, you call it natural law, that um, not only connected to nature we are, but we're also connected to an inner moral compass that tells us what's the right thing. The right thing is, is maybe not to be cruel to somebody, maybe not to use our words or our hitting, whatever it might be, violence, um, but rather to try to be peaceful and coexistent, as we were uh, beginning to experiment with in the 1960s, and as the whole psychedelic drug movement has had a, a share in, in trying to educate us to the wonder of, of our existence, but rather than the simple striving for advantage and for greater income and wealth. I mean, that's the materialistic side is, is only part of the story, a smaller part of the story, really than everything else, and we just need to all recognize that and to step up to the plate. You know, not to be despairing that there's nothing we can do. There is something each one of us can do at any one moment. We can do the right thing. And we can try to broadcast that in terms of our efforts to make a change that is a change that we can live with, that we can be okay with. So take heart is the message. And look for the victories and uh, try to be okay with the defeats and treat them, as Rudyard Kipling says, those two imposters of victory and defeat, treat them just the same. And um, be in, in your own hearts and minds and, and souls, uh, content with what's possible and who you are and who you can become. So that's it, thanks for listening. Best of luck with all that and see you next time.